Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Richard Skipper celebrates the best in entertainment. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique, never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Saturday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. I'm very sorry for the delay, but we were having a little technical issues getting started tonight, but it's been worth the wait because we are going to be celebrating the one and only Mitch Douglas tonight. Anyone who knew Mitch Douglas knew that he was greater and had a life that was bigger than any of the literary projects that he celebrated. And tonight, uh, thanks to my dear friend, Leonardo Rendon, who reached out to me a few months ago and asked if I would put this celebration together. I was thrilled that he asked me. And tonight we have brought some of his greatest friends and some of his colleagues to celebrate this incredible life. So tonight we're gonna celebrate Mitch Douglas and his greatest works and some of his greatest friends. So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for your patience and enjoy the life and career of Mitch Douglas. And Leonardo, there you are. Uh, you reached out to me a few months ago, and I'm so thrilled that you asked me and that you trusted me uh, to be able to put this evening together. Uh, you need to center yourself a little bit more so that okay. we can see you. Uh, but I want to ask you, first of all, uh, first of all, welcome to the show. Uh, okay. How did you and Mitch Douglas meet? Let's start there. Okay, we met um, through a, a, a mutual friend, you know. Um, one day he, Mitch, he needed to change his closet from, you know, get rid of a closet. So he called my friend, John, and John asked me if I could help him, you know, he's like, oh, I, I have this friend and he needs to get rid of closet and could you come and help us? <laughs> so I went to his, I went to his apartment and, um, Mitch was there. Um, and then I saw his collection of books and DVDs and I was like, I was very impressed. I was like, wow. So, um, did you know anything at all about the world that he ha was a part of? I uh, no, 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 no. I I actually didn't know anything about him, you know, until until that the day that we met. Now, mm -hmm. Mitch, I mean, he, we used to get together uh, here in New York, and we would go to Joe Allen's, which was our favorite hangout, and he would just meet, regale me with these wonderful stories and everything. How long were the two of you together? Um, almost five years. Five years. Yeah. And uh, you got an opportunity to meet some incredible show business people, uh, some of that we're going to be meeting this evening. Uh, as you were uh, pulling people together uh, for tonight, um, obviously, there are so many people who have passed on themselves. 
Um, how did you choose the people that are going to be part of tonight's celebration? Well, um, what I did is that I, I, I thought like who knew Mitch from, you know, from his childhood, who met him, you know, in his um, maybe high school years and later on in uh, university and um, Jenny Wiley. Um, and then who, who knew her here in, in New York. So that's how I selected, you know, the group of people. And out of everyone who's here tonight, who has known him the longest? Um, that would be his nephew. That would be, and that would be Donald Jackson right here. Donald. Donald Jackson is here. So Donald Jackson, first of all, thank you for being here. Those, uh, and I am so thrilled that you're here. And I was reading your bio and obviously the two of you grew up together. Um, you know, when I do my own shows and I uh, interview so many people, I always like to go back to the five-year-old self. Uh, and you truly did know him as a child. Um, tell us a little bit about the five-year-old uh, Mitch Douglas and what he was like growing up. Well, when he was five years old, I was one year old. <laughs> um, what I mostly remember about that, uh, his parents and my mother went to church, shall I say, religiously every Sunday. And Mitch thought that was a colossal waste of time. <laughs> so he would pinch me to make me start crying. When I started crying, his parents would say, take Donnie home. <laughs> and I don't know how he dealt with me after we got home, but he didn't have to listen to the pastor rant and rave for an hour. Now, you, I mean, you said in your bio that you felt that you were more like brothers. Uh, I mean, you grew up together um, and you remained very close uh, throughout his entire life. Um, uh, when was the last time that you saw him? Oh, the last time that I saw him was probably about 20 years ago at, uh, well, no, 15 years ago at my mother's funeral. Oh, wow. He came in for that. He was uh, very upset mm -hmm. about the whole thing. Of course, he and mother were very close. I'm not really sure that they understood each other, but mm -hmm. <laughs> but they had remained very close through the years. And so that was the last time. Um, I have been planning a trip to New York to visit Mitch and to introduce him to my wife mm -hmm. and to meet Leo. And uh, unfortunately, the COVID-19 thing came up and then he died. And you know, I, I knew that he had been having some health problems. I didn't know how serious they were. Now, were you amazed at the life and the career that he created for himself? I mean, quite, uh, you know, uh, achievements. I mean, literary agent for Tennessee Williams, Arthur Miller, uh, Graham Greene, so many others that are, I mean, world renowned. Not at all. Mitch was driven. He wanted to be a star, I think, from the time he was about three or four years old. Uh, and he worked very hard at his career, at his art. He was in every play that he could get into with the high school and the little theater. He used me to feed him lines, and because I knew all the parts, I got drafted a couple of times to participate in those. But um, anyway, he left school, um, scholarships just weren't available in those days unless you had the right political connections. And he didn't. His grandfather, you know, he talks about his grandfather's coal mining. Uh, his grandfather would work in the mines for six months, and then he would go out and do something else once he kept the general store in, Gro in Jellicoe, Tennessee, he made moonshine several times. <laughs> and he said he never 
made more than a bare living at moonshine and he said he'd get ten to twelve thousand dollars in the bank and then get caught up still and have to spend every penny of it staying out of atlanta there were times he was a deputy sheriff and there were times he just hoboed around the country I mean, the now man I want to ask cool. you, we all know about his uh professional persona uh but i want to ask you something about his pr uh, private persona what is something that you could tell us about him personally that would surprise a lot of people about him, uh, that uh, about who he was as a, a person that a lot of people may not know about? His mother wanted him to be a fighter. And the way she taught him to be a fighter was to fight with him constantly. Wow. You know, she played the two of us off against each other to the point that I was surprised he didn't speak to me when he grew up. But uh, when he was about four years old, my mother said that she came into a room and he and his mother had their fist balled up and were just going at each other. Hmm. She said, I grabbed Mitch's fist to keep him from hitting his mother and she turned on me. And at that point, she said, I knew that she wasn't trying to discipline him. She was trying to fight with him. And do you think that she was doing this in terms of trying to get him to face the world? Uh, or what was her motivation in doing this with him? I think her motivation was that face the world's a, a good way to say it. She did not want him to be a person who could be pushed around. So her motives were really honorable, uh, you would say. Yeah, her, her motives were the best. Uh, I question her methods, but her motives were the highest. Yeah. Well, we've got a few more people that we want to bring on. John DeLeo wanted to be here this evening. Uh, he had some technical issues being here, uh, but he did send us a message, and I'm going to play this for just a moment. Hi, everyone. It's John DeLeo. I apologize for not being there live, but that's due to my own technical difficulties. Again, I'm very sorry, but here's a way for me to participate in some way. And I'm coming to you live from my uh, movie memorabilia basement. It was a place that Mitch loved and was here very often. Um, I just want to say a few words. Um, Mitch was sometimes my literary agent, and he was wonderful to me on that score and did some great things for me. But when I think about him, I almost forget that he was an agent for me sometimes. Mostly he was a mentor, but even more than that, he was a friend. Mitch, from the day we met about a dozen years ago, he is was always there for me in every possible way in terms of just answering a question or bringing me a disc of something he copied for me, which was always there. And um, I will never forget him for that, for the laughs, for someone to just share so much about the things we both loved. And so he's forever in my heart. And so in this small way, I'm glad I can be a part of it. Much love to him and all of us who loved him. You know, he's with us all forever. So thank you very much. And we are welcoming Stephen Currens to our program. Stephen, thank you so much for being here this evening. And I want to begin with your introduction to Mick Douglas. Uh, first of all, how did you two meet? And if you can tell us a little bit about your professional relationship with Mitch. Well, I, I, there used to be a, a small children's theater company in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, it was very well thought of, actually, and uh, I was cast in a play, and uh, the director was from the university uh, in Lexington, and I was told to come to the university to uh, have some coaching for my role, <laughs> and I was about 14 years old, and I walked into the building, the fine arts building there, and the first person I ever met uh, at the University of Kentucky was Mitch Douglas, and uh <laughs> He was the box office treasurer at the uh, theater there, the, the theater department at a nice theater there. And uh, he was very cheerful and, oh, are you trying to get tickets? He says, oh, we're, we closed that show last night. I'm so sorry. You, you know, I, it's a shame. I said, oh, no, no, sir. I'm looking for uh, this professor, uh, one of the senior professors there. And, oh, he's down the hall. His office is at the end of the hall. 
So I went down the hall and I had my coaching session. And uh, um, the professor, as I came in, he said, uh, who are you talking to out there? And I said, well, uh, Mitch Douglas, he said. I said, he said, Mitch Douglas? You met Mitch Douglas? And I said, yes. He said, are you all right? <laughs> And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I, I'm fine. He said, he said, well, uh, uh, he he's our box office treasurer. And I said, well, I know. He he was telling me about the play you were doing here. And so anyway, that was the first time I ever met him. And uh, a number of years later, I was uh, a student at the university, and Mitch asked me to come and audition for. Um, well, I I was a student in a summer program for high schoolers, actually, and uh, I. Uh, was asked to come and audition for the Jenny Wiley uh, Theater. Uh, Mitch had gotten to know me over a few years in community theater and that sort of thing. And I was, uh, as a high schooler, I was in uh, theater productions at the university, so he knew me there. And um, so uh, he cast me in uh, a chorus uh, position for um, a season of uh, musical theater uh, with uh, Hello, Dolly, and a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. and. Uh, Little Mary Sunshine, and uh, the star for the season was Tommy Kirk, of all people, and uh, we had a wonderful season, except that uh, I we had a, a moat uh, crossover behind the stage. It was an amphitheater outdoors, you know, and there was a crossover ditch kind of thing that you had to go down so you wouldn't be seen on stage and then come up on the other side. And it had some mud in it because it stormed, it had stormed recently. And I slipped and I dislocated my knee, my kneecap. And I ended up in a cast. And a lot of producers would have said, well, <laughs> Steve, you know, you maybe you should just, you know, stay at home for the rest of the season. You know, you're not going to be much good to us here with a cast on your leg. But uh, he didn't. He said, no, come on back. I says, we'll see if we can work you into the show somehow. Well, I did uh, finish the run of Hello, Dolly, and uh, I did Mary Sunshine, the complete run, in a cast, but uh, costume so as to disguise the cast as best we could, and choreographed so as to disguise the cast <laughs> as best we could, and um, I got to be in the season of theater, and I uh, met Tommy Kirk, who became a great friend of mine over the years, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, so Mitch Douglas became also a great friend of mine over the years. And a number of years later, I came from uh, Kentucky uh, to New York with a show that I had written in college uh, based on Edward Gorey's work called Gorey Story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came to see Mitch about it. And he said, well, uh, well let's see what we, what we can do to help you with this. And uh, I talked to a variety of people. I, I, I talked to uh, uh, some people at the theater wing and uh, a few people were trying to help me make introductions to producers and that sort of thing. Well, we ended up doing it off Broadway. Howard Ashman uh, produced it at the WPA theater down in Chelsea and uh, it went over very well and uh, we got good reviews. And uh, so the next person I called, I said, Mitch, uh, we're, we're going to come into Broadway here. And he's like, okay, <laughs> let's see what we can do. Mitch had just uh, begun his career at ICM and uh, it looked really good. And uh, we worked on it for uh, a few weeks and then uh, we had we hit a, a problem. Uh, it was a, a, a business problem, a contractual issue that he felt that um, too many of the artists were being represented by ICM mm -hmm. and the fine person that he is, he said, you know, you really would do better with somebody else. And I said, oh, but Mitch, gotta have you. you've got to be my agent. No, he said, I think you need to do, you go, you need to go see this lawyer and uh, be represented that way. And uh, uh, it's too complicated and too many of the artists are already ICM people and we needed to avoid any conflicts for you. And what, which I thought was a, just a remarkably uh, responsible and kind thing to do because he could have done very well on that show. Uh, he could have, uh, you know, had a, a part of it forever, but uh, he uh, didn't and uh, he gave it up uh, for my benefit. And uh, we lived across the street from each other in uh, um, Clinton, the Clinton district, which was by at that time known as Hell's Kitchen. 
And uh, we lived there for years across the street from each other. We were friends throughout my career in New York. Uh, he helped me get auditions. I auditioned for a, a True one time, and uh, uh, he came to see me. I was off playing off Broadway in uh, Greater Tuna. He came to see the show and very supportive, always of my career, very supportive and very kind and generous of spirit. And, uh, you know, always invited me to his Christmas party, which was always one, yes. you know. And uh, I came with a date one time, and lo and behold, he had a present under the tree for the date. He had never met the man before in his entire life. He says, "Here's a here's a present for you." You know, Mitch was just that amazing, part. just amazing. I want to ask you before I'm going to bring uh, Linda Nolan on in a moment, but I want to ask you what, in your opinion, uh, made Mitch um, such an amazing agent because he was one of the best in the business. And you just described, you know, the fact that he, I, for me personally, it was the fact that he checked his ego at the door. Yeah. Well, you know, he knew who the star was and the star was the client. And uh, it was, uh, you know, sometimes some very important uh, uh, theatrical personages such as Tennessee Williams or Arthur Miller or mm -hmm. Shelley Winters one time. And he did a book for Shelley Winters and uh, he always uh, stayed with those people uh, let, let them have the limelight and he stayed in the, in the back and, uh, he worked really hard. And I think that's really the key to it is that Mitch, Mitch Douglas was a very hardworking man. You know? mm -hmm. So Absolutely. Linda, welcome to the show. I want to ask, uh, same question with you. Uh, how did you and Mitch originally meet? And if you can talk about the evolution of your relationship. Well, I too was a student at the university of Kentucky which means now that I have known Mitch for about 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I must have been 18 or 19 when we met. Uh, I also was in the theater department, of course, was an actor. <clears throat> and uh, he had this little office down the hall from the door to the green room. And, uh, you know, I'm not really sure what his title and his function was. <laughs> But he was, he had an office. It was little, but he had an office and he had the air of authority. <laughs> and he was a mover and a shaker even then. And uh, we just became friends. I don't know. We saw something in each other. And um, I would stop in his office just to chat pra mm -hmm. practically every day for 10, 15 minutes. And uh, he was always interested and always interesting, of course. And he was uh, kind, and his um, his uh, interest in all things theater, of course, was absolutely <laughs> was uh, wonderful for me. And we also shared, you know, our upbringings and our things about our lives and where we were and what we wanted, and uh, so. Um, that continued throughout my four years of college. He also saw everything I did mm -hmm. and uh, was very encouraging and praise, praising me all the time. And he was just really uh, somebody who was in my corner. So uh, one summer also, I well, two summers, I was an actor at Jenny Wiley Summer Music Theater. The second season, Mitch was after great, um, an imbroglio <laughs> uh, thrust into the producer director role. And uh, he called me in and let me know that not only was I playing lead roles in the place, I had to be a costumer too. <laughs> so that was a surprise, but that's just part of his wheeling and dealing. And uh, I didn't hold it against him. He had a way of making everybody come together to give the best their best and of course that's the whole nature of live theater absolutely so, yeah so over the years after that um he went on to new york and had this illustrious career and i'd say there were about 10 years when we in there when we didn't communicate much but then when i started going to new york a lot to visit i looked him up and we have stayed friends ever since Mostly, um, it was when I would visit New York. Uh, one of my sadnesses, he never visited me here at my house in Kentucky because I know he would have loved it. And uh, and uh, I would go up to his apartment all the time and on what, 44th Street, 45th Street. And 
would always meet him for lunch, meet him for dinner, and we would just basically talk about work, talk about private matters, and I'd hear all the dish about all his friends and all the wonderful things he was doing. He gave um, you dish about the business? Oh, my <laughs> <laughs> And about his personal relationships. Yes, of course, of course. <laughs> But, oh, he was fun. He was just so wonderful. I want to ask you, before I bring Mary on, I, I want to ask you, what was the greatest life lesson uh, that you learned from Mitch? Something that he imparted to you uh, that you have carried through your entire life? Well, I, I'd say he was a wonderful example of indefatigable ND. <laughs> I didn't say that right. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was just so energetic. He yes. was just so after his goals. Um, and so uh, go get her. Mm -hmm. And I just really respected that. But he was also a man at the same time. He was a, a good friend and a good person and uh, a good example of a human being. Absolutely. I totally agree. And Mary Bishop, thank you for being here. And uh, I want to ask you the same question. How did you uh, and Mitch originally meet uh, and uh, the evolution of your relationship over the years? I was, um, he was representing Henry Farrell, who was an author who wrote Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Mm -hmm. And I was the executrix of Henry's estate. So I had heard about Mitch, but knew nothing about him. And Henry bequeathed some of the rights to his literary rights to Mitch. And so I was part of the handoff. And it started off really as a very, you know, this is my job. I'm giving you the rights. Goodbye. <laughs> but it never ended up goodbye. Um, he, we were involved in, you know, the, nothing's easy ever mm -hmm. and so in getting these rights he had to finagle who owned them and it was a back and forth back and forth back and forth and it started out really just me doing my job but 16 years later i think it's 16 years later if i do the math 14 mm -hmm. years later 15 years later um mitch became a part of my life and it's interesting because He's so perseverant, so positive, so full of it in in every way, shape, and form that, you know, once he decides you're his, you're his. And he's welcomed me into his heart and into his life. And it just became a friendship. Um, we talked on the phone constantly. We dealt with the literary stuff, whatever was going on, his life, my life, what was going on. And slowly but surely, a week didn't go by. Maybe two, three weeks wouldn't go by before I'd get a phone call. I live in L.A. I came to New York. We met Joe Allens, of course. Yeah, of course. Um, and, you know, it was just this, this friendship and I met Tom yes. and, you know, just before I knew it, I was sort of being carried along in this river called Mitch Douglas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's my experience of him. And, and um, tirelessly, you know, on whatever happened yes. to Baby Jane and, uh, you know, in, and, you know, where did that all of that end up in the end? Or is this something that you can even talk about? Um. Where it's ended up is he he managed to, you know, there's been a lot of interest in doing Baby Jane as a musical or as a straight play on Broadway. But the Aldridge family, the director Aldridge who directed the film, rights were tied up with that. And somehow, by hook and by crook, he was able to buy back the movie rights, at least in the United States. He was able to talk to Warner Brothers, who were always very evasive of, yes, we're here, no, we're not. 
And he was able to get all the rights back and no arguments about it. But it was a daily climb. And he never, ever gave up. I know. You know, that that really was. Um, so now, you know, it's with the pandemic, everything has been on hold. And I think his greatest wish would have been to see it get on stage in his lifetime. And so, um, you know, there's still interest. And hopefully, after all the work he put in, something will come of it. Well, I certainly hope so. Um, I want to bring Lawrence uh, Loritz on. Uh, Lawrence and I have known each other for quite some time. And he's been on this hey. program several times. Uh, Lawrence, uh, you, I mean, he not only was your agent for a while, uh, but you became very good friends as well. Um, same question. How did the two of you meet and uh, the evolution of your relationship over the years? Uh, quite um, uh, an interesting road as well. <laughs> uh, it was an intense relationship I had with Mitch. Um I related so much to what so many people had been saying about him. Uh, I auditioned um, for my third summer stock job as a teenager. At that point, I was only 16 years old. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest in uh, near St. Louis, and I started, started in the children's course at St. Louis Muni. But I heard about these auditions at the University of North Carolina, I think it was. And they auditioned for the summer uh, stock companies in the South. And I got offered three contracts, and one was for the Jenny Wiley Summer Music Theater. <laughs> and um, I was going to take that contract, but Mitch was very persistent, <laughs> as a lot of the guests have talked about. And I ended up going there. I had a marvelous summer. And Stephen, I also fell on that hill oh, and slid halfway down on my butt. <laughs> and I was in the outro drama, Jenny Wiley, Jenny Wiley. <laughs> and I was an Indian, so I had a little loincloth on. And when I told, when I say I slid down on my butt, I slid down on my butt. <laughs> my butt was just full of dirt, but I got up and I finished walking down and I did the show as we all did back then. So anyway, that's how I met Mitch. And then I came to New York and um, I went to the School of American Ballet, uh, which is the training school for the New York City Ballet. And I had a, a, a wonderful ballet career. And at City Ballet, I met Jer Jerome Robbins who was doing his last revival that he directed of Fiddler on the Roof on Broadway in 1981. And he hired, hired me to do that. And I did the National Company and I ended up in Los Angeles and I stayed there for a year and I came back and I had a pass to some gym. And I'm standing there in my underwear getting dressed and some guy says to me, Larry Loritz, you're a Greek god now. <laughs> I turned around, it was Mitch Douglas. I was like, oh, God. Yeah, it's Mitch. So as um, one of you just said that once he claims you, that's it. Mm -hmm. So he says, you're one of my kids, Jenny Wiley, and you're you're always going to be my best friend now, and blah, blah, blah. And can you come by the office and see me? I'm an agent now. He was very excited about it. So I went to his office his office at ICM and um, he worked with me as an agent. Um, years after that, I was um, the choreographer and a guest artist for the Los Angeles Music Center Opera, um, uh, produced, um, the artistic director was Placido Domingo. And there's some contractual problems and Mitch really beat them over the head get them everything you know my own individual curtain call afterwards and my a nice dressing room and he was a very good agent he was also um the writer's agent um for a musical that i produced off broadway that ran for a year you can see the poster behind me yeah, the musical. and it was different working with mitch on that than as a friend because i became the person he had to negotiate with 
and he was tough. Well, uh, be before I bring Bill McCauley on, I want to ask you, how did the dynamics of your relationship change uh, once those lines uh, changed dramatically uh, from being a friend to being in that position of friendship, then a professional relationship? During the, the we did a workshop first, and then... Um, 9-11 happens, so it kind of took two years to get it up off Broadway. Um, it, it changed. But then when that was over with, we went back to being just friends again. But like your other guests have said, you know, he'd always invite me over to his apartment and out to dinner to Joe Allen's. Mm -hmm. um, he would give me gifts at Christmas and birthdays. He was very generous. Yes. And... Um, Full of gossip. <laughs> and we have Bill Bill McCauley here. Uh, Bill, um, again, as I've asked everyone, how did you and Mitch first uh, meet? And again, the evolution of your relationship. Well, I, I moved to New York in 1973, coming from Chicago, where I was uh, doing shows after getting out of school at Northwestern. Uh, I was musical director of the Goodman Theater there. But... Finally, I decided it was time for New York and I moved here. And the day I moved into New York, I carried all my stuff up to my apartment and I was filthy, I was just black. And uh, I'm dying for a beer, it was September the 10th. And so uh, I went downstairs and ducked into the first little restaurant I saw, the restaurant and bar, which was Great Aunt Fanny's. Oh. It was the, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest theatrical hangouts in the, in the city. Uh, and the bar was full of, of theater people all discussing all the shows, all the opening nights, all the movies they'd seen. Uh, Bob Fosse and Gwen Verdon had their own special booth there in the back. And they just welcomed me with open arms. It was the, the best welcome I've ever had anywhere. And it really signaled what the rest of my life would be. And of course, Mitch was one of the guys at the bar. And uh, we became very good friends. And, uh, Fanny's Gladys Easter would sit and play the piano. It was it was a party every single night. And uh, after Fanny's closed, uh, Mitch and I moved a few doors away to Joe Allen's. And uh, we've just been friends all these years. And we sort of made a point of having lunch once a month. But no one uh, that I know really supported theaters the way Mitch did. He went to every show. Whether if, if he, he knew you, he would be at every single show you did. That's but true. it didn't matter if he knew you or not. He wanted to meet the people in the shows that he loved. And he supported theater in general. And uh, I know everybody, he, he, every, he became recognized for that. Uh, people would expect to see him at the stage door or backstage. And uh, yeah, he, uh, he just loved the theater. And uh, as we all do and uh, made it a focal point of his life. Well, Bill, what do you think it was uh, about him that made him such a unique agent? Um, I mean, in this business, uh, you and I both know uh, that uh, agents are sometimes given a very bad rep. <laughs> yes, uh, and, but, uh, and, you know, and in some circles he may have that reputation too, uh -huh. uh, but uh, depending on who you talk to. Uh, but what made him a great agent? Um, he was fantastic bullshit artist. <laughs> I'm, honest to God. You know, I never knew if he was telling me the truth or not, you know? And, and, he, and most of what he told me was the truth. But when he'd get into a negotiation, all, you know, all bets were off. He would tell people anything he thought they'd want to hear if it would move the deal along. And he was very, very good at that. Well, Leonardo, I'm going to ask you. I mean, you know him. I mean, you know him in his private moments better than anybody. Um, did you ever see him in those moments where he was in the negotiating, um, wearing his hat? Yes. And you know, and if there's some insight that you can share with us about those moments that you saw him when he was not in the spotlight, so to speak. Okay, yes, I, I, I witnessed a few times um, while he was negotiating over the phone. 
um, he worked so hard, you know, he, he wake up early in the morning, he checked his emails, he made sure he replied to everyone. And sometimes he would call me and say, Leo, I need you to sit next to me. I need you to listen to this conversation and, um, and just pay attention. And that's what I did. Did he want you there as a witness? <laughs> uh, he wanted me as a witness and also he wanted me to learn. He said, um, I, I want you to, to listen to this because one day it's going to come handy to you. And what about you, Donald? I mean, what business acumen did you learn from Mitch Douglas? I mean, obviously he was a brilliant businessman. Well, as Bill said, he was a wonderful bullshit artist. But when it came down to a contract, you get everything on the paper and you do what the paper says. Okay. And once you make a deal, you've made a deal. You don't go back on it. And Stephen, as far as your working relationship was with uh, with Mitch, uh, was there ever an issue where you saw him, where his back was really against the wall and you saw how he maneuvered his way out of a situation that you could share with us? I, I've seen him upset. I've seen him I'm very upset <laughs> with certain people. Uh, I, I don't know if I should name anybody. No, but, don't. No. <laughs> no. But uh, he, yes, uh, and but you know, he always gave them the benefit of the doubt, and you know, he, and he would say some. Sometimes he would say some angry things, and then he would say, "Oh, but you know, you know, I, I really like him, or I really like her, and she's such a great actress, or he's such a great artist, you know, whatever, you know." He really, he was not a petty person at all. He was a very, very magnanimous person. And he, uh, he, he cared a lot about art and about the theater and about the films, films, music, uh, musical theater. I mean, he's, to me, he was one of the best musical theater educators that I ever met. Yes. I, I, I mean, he knew more about uh, mm -hmm. New York theater and especially musicals than anybody I ever knew. And I, I lived in New York for 20 years and he was uh, one of the best, uh, most knowledgeable people I ever ran across. Mm -hmm. And he was very kind. He was very generous. And uh, and he didn't hold a grudge. He really did. He didn't hold grudges. He didn't believe in that. No, he didn't. Like, I, you know, it was like do business. And, uh, you know, if you get mad, then OK, but uh, go have a drink later you know, with with that person, if necessary, you know. Get over it. You know? Now, Linda, you mentioned that there was a 10-year gap where the two of you didn't see each other. Mm -hmm. And when there's someone in your life and there's that kind of love and that kind of bond, I'm sure that those 10 years melt away like that. Oh, of course. Um, no doubt. Yeah. So when, you know, when the two of you saw each other again mm -hmm. after that 10-year absence, um, what was that like for the two of you again after such a long time? Oh, well, we were thrilled to see each other again and thrilled to be together again. And um, that's understood. But I also wanted to say something. I ended up <clears throat> owning a manufacturing company. And I came to Mitch for advice on contracts for foreign, <laughs> foreign yeah. distributors. And he had no qualms in trying to advise me on uh, what to get in that contract. <laughs> and that's fairly recently. And... Uh, so I, I appreciate that acumen as well. I'd like to change the subject for just a second no, and ask ahead. everybody if you know why Mitch refused to see Hamilton. <laughs> 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 I told him over and over it was one of the best things I'd ever seen in my life. And he just said, I have no desire to see that. <laughs> he hated <laughs> rap music. Oh, Mitch, that... and I were, Mitch and I were in agreement on that. Oh, I really? cannot abide hip hop. I've, well, everybody's trying to push me to see Hamilton. Oh, I they, see. Bought, they bought me the CDs, yeah, yeah. and I, it's two CDs, and right. I, I can only get through the first half of the first one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I consider hip hop and rap music as very bad Gilbert and Sullivan without the Sullivan. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, well, Mary, there's other if, kind of music besides that. In so, the um, when uh, whatever happened to Baby Jane is eventually done, it will not be done as a hip hop musical, <laughs> will it? <laughs> uh, I'm I'm betting money no. 
<laughs> Mary, I want to ask you. I mean, obviously, in this business, I mean, it's it, you know, it's a it's an incredible thing when a uh, working relationship becomes a friendly relationship, and those lines become blurred. When did that relationship become a friendly relationship between the two of you? And was it at, over uh, dinners at Joe Allen's? Mary. Yes, Mary. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> uh, you know what? I was always on. Oh, I'm sorry. This was this was the first long distance love affair I have ever had. <laughs> Truthfully, we met in the flesh once. All the rest of it was carried on remotely via telephone, emails, but talking on the phone, conversations, yakking. That was it. And he had no filters. He had not an unexpressed thought. And it was, I never, I never pulled any punches about who I was or what I did or who he was. And it was just this, it's like walking into somebody going, hi, you don't know me. Here you go. Open arms. And it never stopped. You never, never had a, you never had a That's conversation. That's the only way I can describe it. You never had a conversation of, of a banana cream pie at Joe Allen's? No, we, I think it was a Tangeray martini that he had. If I, if, if memory serves, we had lunch. I just remember it was the one time I'm from the East coast. So I came back there, but I didn't go back a lot, but that wasn't what cemented the friendship. It's looking back now going, I can't believe this many years has flown by on something that started out as just, I'm doing my legal duty, passing this on to you. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh no, oh no, doesn't end here, sweetheart. And that's what it was. <laughs> I, I, I have no other way to describe that. That's great. Uh, Lawrence. Yes. Uh, and uh, I miss him. Yes, it just it, he was such a force, force of nature. Yeah. Uh, Lawrence, uh, you know, again, um, negotiating on boobs. Uh, and that's interesting to say that. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, but, the musical. Uh, uh, the, uh, the musical, yes. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm sure, I mean, getting through some difficult times and uh, there were some, uh, and, Getting through around, you know, the time of 9-11 and dealing with a lot of rocky patches through that show. Um, what was the cement that kept you going, the two of you, through this and everything? Um, well, we both wanted it to happen. And for, for people who don't know, it was based on the songs of Ruth Wallace, who wrote party songs in the 50s and 60s. And about half of them, maybe three quarters of them, were sexually suggestive. And it was really wild for the 50s. When you listen to them today, they're so innocent. Like <laughs> Davy's Dinghy was one of her wild songs. He's got the cutest little dinghy in the Navy. You know, so funny. So we did this whole show around her songs. And um, Ruth Colt. Cold called him at ICM. And she says, I'm a little old grandmother living in Connecticut. You don't know who I am, but my name is Ruth Wallace. And Mitch sang back the entire Davies dinghy song to her because <laughs> he collected her records as a, as a little kid in Kentucky. And she like was shocked. So he was really emotionally attached to this project and he really wanted it to happen. So despite our relationship of having to negotiate with, with each other, which was a difficult period of time, we both had the common goal. I do want to tell you one really funny story about Mitch Duck. Oh yeah. Um, this apartment that I live in right now was an apartment that his, one of his ex-boyfriends lived in, Ray people who knew Mitch for a long time will remember Ray. 
Anyway, he was moving out of this apartment and I was just moving back from California and I needed a, an apartment and he suggested this and I'm still here, although I would like to move. Uh, but the funny story was, is that in that period of time when I didn't have an apartment for two years, um, I came back to do a project for Alexander Cohen, the Broadway producer. Uh, these two children musicals I choreographed and I performed in one also. So I called up Mitch and I said, I'm doing this project. I have no place to stay. He says, well, come stay with me. And I said, well, I was just going to ask you. So I stayed at his apartment and I've always been intuitive. Um, and during the night, I swear to you, I was sleeping in that little bedroom, the people who know that old walk through apartment where all the records were. He had the biggest record collection. And as I was going to sleep, I saw the spirit of Tennessee Williams standing there after he had died. So I just looked and, you know, I was wondering if he was going to talk or, or something like that. And he just gave me the most beautiful smile. So I didn't know how, if I should tell Mitch or whatever. So the next day we're talking and I said, Mitch, I want to tell you, you know, what I saw in your apartment last night. You so tell me, and I said, well, Tennessee Williams appeared to me, and he gave me the most beautiful smile, and he was just staring at me, and I said, um, I, I just had the feeling that now that Tennessee Williams is on the other side of life, that he wants, you know, to be friends and make up and not to have any more hard feelings between the two of you, and Mitch didn't say a word. I said, oh. I said, I know you probably don't believe in such things. He says, oh, no, I believe you saw Tennessee Williams. I just don't believe he was smiling. <laughs> <clears throat> wow, wow. Um, Bill, I want to ask you, what, when was the last time that you saw uh, Mitch? Uh, le less, about a month before he died. Um, one of our Joe Allen lunches. Yeah, um, I, and I have a reason for what I'm going to ask you. Um, can you tell us about your last conversation? Oh, um, it was it was the same as all our other conversations. We discussed our friends, uh, the, the theater season. Uh, it was I had I had no idea there was any sort of health problem at the time, you know? And uh, we just had a, a lovely lunch as we always did. Mm -hmm. You know, I asked that question. Uh, we are, we're gonna wrap up in just a few moments. And I wanna thank all of you for being here tonight. Uh, Mitch, for those of us who were lucky enough to know him, uh, Mitch, uh, I live in Rockland County and uh, Mitch and Tom as well, uh, they would call me uh, at the last minute and say, um, we're going to be at Joe Allen's this afternoon. Come and join us for lunch. And uh, I would get on the bus, and go into the city and have lunch and hear these incredible stories and hear the latest uh, stories about what was happening uh, with whatever happened to baby Jane, hoping that it was getting closer to Broadway. That was always the hope. Um, and uh, the frustration that he was going through, Mary, I lived uh, vicariously uh, through those frustrations. <laughs> um, it He wanted it so much uh, to get here. And uh, I heard those stories. And, uh, uh, and I asked that question, Bill, because um, I end all of my shows by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. I always ask everybody to pick up the phone and call your friends that mean so much to you. Because you never know uh, when you're not going to be able to have that opportunity again. And I say this not in a morbid way, but because all of us uh, don't know when that opportunity is not going to be there anymore. I always say at the end of all my shows, and if you don't believe me, go back and look at some of them. Uh, to go to your Facebook friends list, uh, like today, go to the sixth name on your Facebook friends list uh, and reach out with a phone call. 
not an email message, not a text message, not a private message, but a phone call. And let that person know what they mean to you. Uh, because as a dear friend of mine, David Friedman always says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And I always say, but if you're going to be out in a boat, make sure you bring a skipper along. <laughs> now, uh, I'm going to be leaving the screen in just a moment. And we're going to go around the screen. And I'm going to give each of you uh, a final word. I'm going to go Donald, Stephen, Linda, Lawrence, Bill, Mary, and then Leonardo. Leonardo. Uh, remember it in this order. Uh, because I'm going to give each of you a final thing that you want to say about Mitch, uh, whether it be something that we talked about tonight that you want to expound upon, something that we didn't talk about that you wish that we had, or just a final message that you want to leave everyone with tonight. Uh, Mitch, for those of us who knew him, he was a force of nature, what I love about Mitch and what I remember was that he created his own life. He molded his own creation. Uh, he lived by his own rules. Uh, he was his own creation. He didn't let anything get in the way. Um, he lived each day as if it was his own entity. Uh, he didn't think about yesterday. Maybe he did, but it was today. And he thought about today. What have I got to do today? And then he was going to go home and take care of the cats. Um, <laughs> that's what it was about. And that's my message to everyone tonight. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. You could have been anywhere else. Uh, I hope that you had a great time. Uh, if you don't know about Mitch Douglas, read about him. Go out and read the articles. Uh, check these people out. Celebrate them celebrate each other, and go out and do good deeds uh, because that's what it's about. Thank you all. I'm going to leave the screen, and you all will have your own say. Have a good night. Thank you Thank for you. doing this. Thank you, Richard. Thank, Thank you, Richard. Richard. And Donald, you've got the floor. Uh -huh. well, There's a couple of anecdotes I'd like to leave you with, but... Um, one of them, when he was at Jenny Wiley, he went out into the country, removed all of his clothes, and had a picture taken of himself, <laughs> made Tarzan green with envy, had eight by ten prints of this made, and framed one and put it and gave it to his mother. <laughs> and, um, he just popped it on top of the television and said, here, mother, I brought you a picture of me. Well, she was not about to acknowledge that by looking at it. But the picture stayed there for about six weeks. And our neighbor, Lois Massengill, came over one day, and I think she thought, okay, it's been long enough. She just enjoyed the picture and said, well, Mitch sure did grow up to be a big, fine man, didn't he? <laughs> Granny looked at that picture. And I think her eyes about popped out of her head. She grabbed it and ran to the kitchen and threw it in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know what became of it, but uh, I hope that he's got a copy or two in his effect. <laughs> um, yeah. Our family always took a great deal of pride in doing what we damn well pleased rather than what was socially convenient. And I'm sure that you know that that came out in Mitch. But from my earliest rec recollection of him, he wanted to be a star, and he became a star. Maybe not on the silver screen or on the Great White Way, but in 1991, I was visiting him in New York. We went into Sardis, and the maitre d' said, oh, Mr. Douglas, your table's right over here. And that's stardom. Okay, who's next? Stephen? Well, I uh, uh, spent uh, two uh, summer trips with Mitch going back to Jenny Wiley for a uh, reunion of sorts. And we were in the car. I drove uh, to the mountains from uh, Lexington area up to Appalachia. 
I mentioned I had a occasion to do quite a bit of talking in a private way that we didn't usually talk. We didn't usually have an opportunity to talk that way. And he did tell me about uh, two and a half years ago that he said, I have, Stephen, I have a brain tumor. And I said, well, it's okay, though, isn't it? Are you going to be all right? And he said, oh, I don't know. He said, we'll see. And uh, then uh, he did tell me again when he found out that he had been diagnosed that he had had brain tumors, plural. And he said, um, they want to do a an investigation, and I'm going to go in and, and, and do that. And uh, uh, I hope you'll be okay. And uh, don't worry. And I said, oh, I won't worry. But I, you know. Uh, are you, you know, are you going to be okay yourself? Emotionally, I mean, I mean, I care about you very much. And he said, uh, I think I will be. And uh, he said, um, I may not come back, but if I don't, he said, I want you to know that I always loved you. And I said, well, you know, I always loved you too. And uh, you have been there for me in the shadows of my life, uh, always uh, there over and over again when I needed somebody. And uh, it was always Mitch Douglas in New York, particularly. And I said, I want to tell you one thing, Mitch, that I think you're very brave, you know, to be able to handle this the way you are and that you know that you're going into the hospital and you may not return. But I said, you're one of the bravest people I've ever seen, really. And uh, we said we loved each other. And we had an occasion again when he was probably not able to talk, I don't think, but uh, he heard me, I believe. And I spoke to him over the telephone and we, we, we uh, again uh, said goodbye to one another. So I think that uh, he was a very courageous man. You would think that he might be, a, he might not have been uh, really, you know, because he loved life so much <laughs> that he wouldn't want to say goodbye to life, but he seemed like he was okay with that too. He accepted that too. And uh, I think he was a very courageous man and uh, the outrageous uh, language or behavior or mannerisms or whatever that he sometimes indulged in were, you know, a, a, a young man who wanted to be loved and uh, who grew up to be an old man who wanted to be loved. And uh, we did love him very much. That's beautiful, Steve. Well, <clears throat> I, um, I'm sorry, Mitch did not confide in me that he was ill. And the first I heard of it was when Leo called me. And Mitch was in his final days. Um, but we did say we loved each other. I'd like to say just a moment about Tom Gates. Um, Leo, it was very generous of you to remember Tom in your, your um, writing about Mitch. Uh, Tom and Mitch were a wonderful couple. They truly brought out the best of each other. And they were very similar in their, their drives, shall we say. And um, Mitch's uh, memorial for Tom, what I found extremely beautiful and touching. Uh, not only Mitch's speech, but the whole, the whole uh, event was just a glorious celebration and was very meaningful to me to participate in. And it showed me a side of Mitch that I knew was there, but doesn't come out all the time. And uh, I, I loved him for that. And uh, Tom would certainly like to be here today if he could be. So thank you for including him, Leo. It was very, very kind. Uh, Mitch actually, yes, was a force, force of nature. And I so miss speaking with him. New York will never be the same for me when I go back because he's not there. And uh, there's not many people that I've known that long, just a few years longer than you, Steve. <laughs> but I miss him. I loved him. And I respected him and admired him. And my life is emptier without him, as all of ours are. So thank you, Mitch. Love you. See you soon. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just wanted to say how touching uh, this evening has been. I want to thank uh, Richard um, for hosting us. 
hearing everybody's stories about Mitch has been really healing for me and how there's such a thread between all of our stories and um, of the love that we all had for him. And he could be quirky and, and um, you know, irritable sometimes. And But the Mitch that I remember is always having so much fun with him. He got me so drunk one time on wild turkey, which I have never had in my life. He said, oh yeah, Larry, try this, you'll love it. And it was like one after another. I had the worst hangover in my life <laughs> after that. It's one of my strong memories. We're at Don't Tell Mamas. Um, but for me, because I've met him so young, he was always like an adult expert to me. And uh, I always looked up to him. Um, I loved his knowledge of musical theater and theater in, in general. And um, just that he was such a generous person. And I want to give my love to Leonardo as well. I know this has been a really difficult time for you and my heart, my heart is with you. Thank you. Uh, well, as we've all said, Mitch loved the theater more than anything. And the joy of being with him and discussing Noel Coward, the Lunts, Gertrude Lawrence, uh, the history of theater. The, the reason we have the theater we have now is because of all those people and all those performances we saw then or didn't even see, but were told about by mm -hmm. folks older than us. And... Uh, now another one of those chunks of history is gone with Mitch. And I hope those things get passed on by other people. I certainly enjoy talking about the past and theater history. And there are some young people in New York who are fascinated by, English, by theater history. And I think they're guarding the flame for us. But uh, without Mitch, it falls on the rest of us even more steadily uh leah what you wrote about mitch on facebook was just beautiful and uh it really did sum up a lot uh of course i'll miss him but uh i think he's still with us all yes yes well it looks like it's you and me kid yes. <laughs> ladies first well i just yes your facebook tribute to him was beautiful it was really lovely. And Larry? Okay, um, Mitch, I just wanna say thank you so much for opening your heart to me, for, for letting me be part of your life. You meant so much for me. I'm not. Oh, you're back. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I I I just came off. Were okay. you talking? Yes. Um, Go. Yeah. I just saying that I'm I'm so thankful to to Mitch for you know for opening his heart and uh, for letting me be part of of his life. Um, I miss him so much. Um, but I know that that he's with me. You know. <laughs> you go ahead, and Mary. Well, all I all I really wanted to say was I really learned from him. You know, I learned that living really not taking no for an answer, and that kind of perseverance, that that just dogged determination, and this full knowledge that it was going to happen. I mean, he never stopped pushing his shoulder against a rock to get it to go up the hill. He never stopped. And I learned something from him about that. I just learned the incredible strength and, and he, it, it, I, and I always, every time I think about, Oh, I can't do this. Oh, I can't go on. Oh, whatever it is. I remember that. That's the legacy. 
And I think when Henry died and, you know, I take my dog to Will Rogers. And but when I walk my dog, I see Henry's house. And not a day goes by that I haven't said, hey, Henry, I know that you engineered me and Mitch meeting. And I've always been grateful. Thank you. And Thank I'm you. also glad that you and I know each other. Thank you, Mary. I'm glad to. Um, I want to thank uh, Richard Skipper for giving us this platform for this uh, virtual tribute. Um, I know Mitch would have loved it. Um, I, um, I just want to share what he said to me um, a few days before he passed away. Um, he said to me, Leo, if it's my time to go, I'm fine with it because I have lived my life with the fullest without regrets. And I think that's the way we all should live our lives. Um, and best, um, do the best every day. Thank you.